Hello Seawolves and welcome back to the show. I hope that you all have something delicious waiting. Let me press this here real quick. There we go. And Really good start of the day. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Here we go. Finally, back home again, it was really a lot of running around uh, yesterday, late nights, but uh, I think we made a really nice uh, addition. If you haven't seen it yet, definitely make sure to check out yesterday's uh, show when we visited the uh, Volvo 65, or I should say Ocean Race 65, uh, now renamed Childhood, which was the form formerly uh, the Brunel uh, boat. Very, very uh, uh, nice day. Very, very cool to see such a fantastic you know, sailing boat up close. And, uh, and personal and uh, we have another good show uh, today because we're going to be joined by uh, Jeff Brown in a minute here the uh, technical manager of uh, Pip Hair because of course I'm sure that some of you are already aware but some of you also may not Pip has actually made it happen so she has uh, replaced the broken rudder managed to uh, replace it and is now back in the race again uh, nicely uh, fighting her way back hopefully at some point into her previous position she hasn't really lost too many miles. I mean, she definitely fell, you know, quite a way uh, behind, of course, uh, uh, Alan and uh, Arnold Bozarius, uh, who she was, of course, uh, racing against for the most part. But she seems to be on a good lean again now. So uh, that's uh, very nice. And um, I actually thought it would be really cool to kind of dive into this particular subject because it's a highly technical thing to, of course, replace a uh, rudder, something I think many of you will be very interested in. Um, and uh, fortune has it that Pip actually practiced this maneuver in the marina and actually filmed practicing this maneuver. So uh, before we get into the talk uh, with Joff, I'm going to show you the video of her actually uh, kind of replacing her rudder, uh, kind of mock replacing it in the marina to practice this. And then we're going to talk about talk with Joff about you know her actually doing that same maneuver uh, actually in the Southern Ocean. So let's start actually uh, with that. No, wait a minute. Actually, I did forget one thing because, uh, of course, the Jules Verne, and I wanted to start the show with that uh, every day, so I will uh, interject here. And uh, right now, uh, the uh, the status is still um, a departure between 24 and 48 hours. Now, uh, originally, they had more or less planned to leave uh, either today or uh, uh, tomorrow, so that's still kind of shifting. But uh, for those of you who are like, well, they keep saying this, don't they like put an exact time and date on it? No, they're basically on standby. So the whole crew is there and they're literally taking it kind of hour by hour, half a day by half a day, looking at the weather, looking for, you know, not just a good opportunity, but the best opportunity you can find within those 48 hours to actually depart. And then of course, you know, comparing all the different models for the long race and saying, well, if you go now, do we have at least like the first week good prediction and do we not see any major problems in the rest along the rest of the route that could really uh, hamper us soon and so no choice there but to uh, wait okay so now over to uh, pips maneuver practice at first in the marina in uh, la sable the first problem we need to overcome changing the rudder is actually um, the buoyancy in the new rudder uh, because the the rudder blade itself really wants to float and so it's quite difficult to sink it down into the right orientation to get the stock through the hull. So what you can see us doing here is taking all the anchor chain out of the bow and we've put it into that yellow container and then we're going to hang the yellow container off the back of the boat from the boom and then the idea is that the weight of that chain uh, pulls the bottom of the rudder blade vertically down um, and enables me to put it in. So here you're watching me take the old rudder out. Uh, most of this can be done um, from on the boat and actually if I have to change a rudder at sea it will be a lot easier. Uh, to take the older rudder out because there won't be so much buoyancy assuming the rudder will be broken so here we're sort of having to smack it a bit to get it out but I think with the broken rudder it should come quite a lot easier and there's the old rudder coming out 
So the chain dragged the old rudder stock down through the hole and then you can see how buoyant it is. I released it in the water and there's the old rudder coming out. So I'm just prepping up the ropes there. The one I'm tying is the rope that will be attached to the bottom of the rudder. So old rudder's out. Um, now we're just prepping up the new one to put it in. So line number one onto here goes onto the top of the stock and this is the one that's going to pull the stock back up through here. And we're just being super careful at the moment so we don't damage it. So you can see we made a, a special sort of garter to fit the rudder uh, and the rudder is going to be stored in a padded bag with that garter on it already so I'm ready to go if I need to change them. So here we are dropping the new rudder into the water. You can see how the chain is just pulling it vertically down there. And then the red rope is going through the hull, so through the top bearing, through the bottom bearing. And that's what I'll pull the stock back into the boat with. So now I'm just pulling the stock into the boat. And once the stock's located with the red rope, then I can ease the green rope off, which is the one that's pulling the rudder down. So then you probably need to ease your green a bit once and Just sort of balance the two to allow the natural buoyancy in the rudder to push it back up through oh, yeah. the hole. She's coming up. And there we go, final little bit. Success. So just looking at that in the marina, huh, you can really see it's a tough, fiddly process. Uh, her actually having to get into the water, um, you know, not, a, not an easy thing. It's obviously a lot of weight uh, when it's out of the water. And then at the same time, when it's in the water, it has a lot of buoyancy. It's actually pushing up and wanting to uh, float. So that's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, difficult maneuver if you look at it uh, just like that. And so, um, yeah, let's uh, get into the conversation uh, actually uh, with Joff now and see what he had to say about her doing actually this maneuver while in the middle of the Vendiglo race. Okay, so uh, we're on with uh, Geoff Brown, technical director, if I say uh, correctly, yep. for uh, Team uh, Malaysia. Welcome, Geoff, on the show. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, especially uh, kind of we had we'd already planned this meeting, but we didn't know that it was going to be such exciting days uh, uh, right now, of course. Uh, so. Um, uh, I did hear that uh, um, actually uh, Pip managed to fix the rudder and is now on her way again, fully operational, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just checked uh, the latest position before we came on, and she's back eating, eating up the other guys. I think hopefully. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah looking yeah. to get back to fifteenth as soon uh, as can. Yeah, well, let's hope that, uh, you know, nothing else, that everything stays uh, great uh, for now. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, you know that with the Seawolves, we like to get a little bit uh, technical with everything. So, um, you know, I got, got a few uh, questions, but also feel free to, you know, add any other elements that you think are, uh, are interesting. The first thing that I thought, and I also got a few questions from our viewers about it, is that uh, how did Pip actually uh, figure out uh, this breakage because uh, you know obviously she makes every two hours or so a check of the whole boat of the different uh, systems um, but uh, you know I, I've seen the boat I've seen video of the boat I've also seen the video of you actually practicing this uh, you know in the marina yeah. before she went uh, we'll get back to that um, but how is it actually possible for her to see into the rudder stock uh, this breakage uh, let's say like how was that how where exactly did she or how did she kind of notice that this was going on well, it's, uh, it's one of those things that sort of builds, really. I think she'd reported a, a creaking um, a day before, but she'd actually thought it was the boom, the end of the boom that was creaking. Um, yeah. But that has now stopped, so it's transpired that that was actually the rudder stock. And I think she first noticed on deck that uh, you can see the very top of the rudder stock on deck. Yeah. Um, so she noticed that that had slipped down about 15, 10, 15 millimetres. Um, mm -hmm. So we actually thought the clamp, there's a clamp that sits on the stock that stops it slipping down. Um, yeah. We kind of thought that that must have loosened or something. So she'd got in the back to tighten that up um, and and then realised that the whole bearing was kind of um, rotating in its in it, in all axis, really, um, sort of free to rotate. And it was kind of really working, which it shouldn't be doing. Um, mm -hmm. And so she sent me a video of that and I was looking at it and then I was kind of like, I think actually the stocks, you know, you could see a, a bit of damage and I was like, can you just go and check that the stock's not broken? 
Um, uh -huh. So she went back to check and said, uh, yeah, the stock's broken. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Because as I understand it, it's basically so the thing that rose, so the, the rudder itself, we, we've seen the shape of it. It's basically, of course, it's a one piece uh, a yeah. thing, let's say. And it actually just sticks in. So I assume that it can only fit in kind of in one way so that it's firm and that the, the, the rotating element, which is on the boat itself, which is not part of the rudder itself. Can then uh, can then rotate it, right? So for just from my understanding. Yeah, so it's got a top and bottom bearing. The top bearings in the deck, the bottom bearings in the hull, and they're just um, they're like a rose bearing, so they've got full full movement across all axes. Um, yeah, but yeah. don't really need much of that. Um, and yeah, uh, you just slide it in from the bottom of the boat, and then there's a clamp that sits on the stock that stops it sliding out again. But effectively, they're so buoyant um, that they can't fall out anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Can you uh, can you talk us a little bit? through so you know then once you've noticed uh, uh, what was going on um you know uh, obviously she put the boat on the other tack i guess to make sure that uh, you know no more no more tension on this particular rudder can you talk yeah. a little bit through the through the steps that she uh, that she had to take because of, you know people can watch the video of course of her doing it in the marina but now i think she was in still like 10 to 18 knots of wind or so when she actually attempted the maneuver so can you talk us a little bit through, you know, the different steps that she had to do and also maybe in kind of how to set up the boat, like what did she do to get the boat as stable as possible in order to actually then affect this whole dance of getting the old rudder out and getting the new one in? Yeah, so I think to start with, there's obviously a bit of, um, a bit of stress to, and it sort of takes time for <laughs> her and me to understand what the problem is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as soon as we discovered that, she went and um, took the mainsail down. Um, I think just put the J3 up, and so she's just sort of trund trundling along at sort of seven, seven, eight knots um, mm. while we kind of thought about the options. Um, yeah. I think when you sort of look at the tracker and you realise where she is in the world, you kind of think there's not many places you <laughs> would want to be less than exactly where she is. <laughs> definitely, kind of... definitely. Yeah. It's like where um, do I and... not want to put a rudder uh, change? That would be yeah right around that point right <laughs> yeah so you look at what are the options like to get to no breeze was 700 miles north which is probably two or three days um she could have could have gone on that on port tack with the starboard rudder mm -hmm. um she felt she's obviously been down there a long time so she's got a good grip on the weather mm -hmm. um forecast and she felt that there was a window you know on coming and then yeah. after that there was another potential window um of less breeze um, but at the same time, she's in the Southern Ocean, so there is always a residual swell, yeah, um, yeah. and it's how it's how that's going to impact the, doing the job. Mm. Um, but I think you know she got her boat under control. She was doing seven, eight knots. Um, it was relatively sedate, um, mm. and we, you know, I think we both got confidence from that, um, and then just sort of talked through it, and we're just like, well, let's let's try it, let's do it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, and so can you talk us a little bit through the uh, the steps of what she actually kind of had to do to, to get the old rudder out? And does she still have the old rudder, or did she did she ditch that as she uh, as she got it out, or is she trying to repair that again just in case you know she develops maybe another problem and use it as a spare part again? Like, can you talk us a little bit through that process? Uh, yeah, sure. No, she did manage to recover it. I, we weren't sure at uh, one stage whether she would be able to or whether we'd actually have to cut through where the damage was to actually get the rudder out easily mm -hmm. um, but she has recovered and I think with um, you know it's always nice to a, for, to recover something and not leave it in the ocean um, yeah. and secondly you never know what you might need you know on those boats so why not take it with you you know you exactly yeah yeah, turn yeah, it yeah, into yeah something else maybe if we need it later yeah, um, yeah. so yeah so we don't as you talk about we had a we had a plan always for how you do it mm -hmm. um, you can't really practice it in anger at sea because you don't want to damage your existing rudder you don't want to damage your new spare rudder yeah. um, so you can really only test it in sort of fairly benign conditions in the marina mm -hmm. um, but we know I think that having had having done that you know because even on the pontoon it seems difficult um, even with you know because the team were there to help and uh, it seems difficult but I think having done it you then got the you know Pip had the confidence that she could do it and yeah. knew the steps to doing it yeah, and she, um, and she, she used she, sorry she she used that same uh, sort of uh, a trick that you guys practice in the in the marina to use actually the anchor chain to weigh down the the buoyancy of the of the rudder and actually kind of 
sink it down uh, uh, partially, I understand. Yeah, that... exactly. So she based the, the, we put all of the chain, which is about 50 kilos, we have uh -huh. to have um, in the rule. Um, mm -hmm. It lives in one container and we already have a, a, a harness on that so that it, that, so that we know we can lower that yeah, down yeah. safely. And I guess she just dropped that probably five or six meters underwater uh -huh. uh, with a antel ring on it um, and uh -huh. a downline. So effectively that stays where it is. And then you use a downline to control winding the old rudder down and out and yeah. also winding the new rudder down and then easing that back up um, mm -hmm. and through the, through the holes. And, and did she actually have to enter the water herself to get those lines across uh, kind of like the, the lower side of the, of the rudder in order to be able to pull it down? Or was she able to do this and actually without having to dive into the water herself at some? Because in the marina, I did see her dive into the uh, water. Of course, she did mention that it was maybe possible to do it without it. But how did that end up uh, uh, going? Yeah, so she did manage to do it all without entering the water. Again, the reason to go in the water at, um, on the pontoon is kind of to get her used to maybe having to do it if she had a problem, but also mm -hmm. just preserving the, the rudders we have so that we're not scratching up our race rudder. Yeah, yeah. Um, two weeks before the start uh -huh. um but this time no she actually managed to uh with the boat heeled over on port she mm -hmm. managed to get a loop around the bottom of the rudder um with a downline on it and then she drilled a hole in the top of the rudder and tied it off so effectively she had a point at the bottom of the rudder that she could pull down on yeah uh, so which is pretty good going i mean I don't yeah, know. yeah 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 i yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. i sort of you know we talked about it, we said well ideally you would do that because the rudder is so buoyant and it sits at an angle, even with the boat flat, it sits at an angle, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and it just wants the bottom of the blade just wants to tip up to the surface, which yeah. makes it getting out of the bearings quite difficult. Um, so yeah. if you can pull it from the bottom, it's a lot easier. And she managed to do it. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's, just, it's just always hard to get to, you know, people who are non-sailors who are watching this kind of to, to uh, communicate to them kind of the cleverness and, uh, you know, what it takes to make this kind of maneuvers, especially, you know, when you're in probably three meter waves bopping around trying to get something uh, uh, out of there. And uh, yeah. as I understand it also, uh, you, you had, of course, a little bit forewarning, let's say, because uh, when the boat was still La Fabrique in a previous edition, um, apparently, you know, they had a similar uh, rudder problem and also had to make a, a change in the rudder more or less in the same point also in the race, actually, right? Or yeah. am I wrong on that? Yeah, he, I think he hit something. So his whole, uh, the, most of the rudder, I think, was broken and smashed away. Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't have anything left. So he was actually taking on water um, through the lower bearing. Ah, uh, okay. And we've slightly modified, knowing the problem he had, we slightly modified the boat. So there's like a waterproof uh, boot um, around the bearing so that the, the, even without the rudder in, we're not taking on water. And he ah, didn't have yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so he, he went the other way, basically, and healed the boat over on port. Mm -hmm. um, I guess put a harness on and literally sort of climbed over the side of the boat and shoved it in. No, which, to, to shove it out. <laughs> to me, is an incredible way of doing it. But I think if you haven't got, you know, the way we did it is very is relatively controlled and you're mm -hmm. in control of everything at the same time. He didn't have that option, I don't think, or yeah. hadn't, hadn't practiced that option. And he went the other way and yeah, hats off to him as yeah, a yeah, remarkable yeah, yeah. way of doing it. Yeah. Did, did you actually practice like multiple scenarios or was this really your one scenario that you had for like, if we lose one of the uh, rudders, we have the spare, then this is basically the procedure or was there also, and well, in case we have to top it over and climb over the same way. Did you also like practice that or that was never a consideration this time around? Not in my book. No, I think I, I was pretty happy that the way we did it, you could do it normally. Yeah. I think we, with the conditions that she was facing, I did, we did think about doing it his way, um, but the risk to Pip is quite high doing that, I think, and the risk yeah. of maybe losing that spare rudder um, over the side. Is quite yeah. high so i th i think as we sort of just you know as the weather developed and it looked like she was going to get get the opportunity and the swell mm. die down a bit i think our way you know uh, I, we were pretty happy with yeah uh, what we're doing. Oh, very nice and um any uh, any ideas as to what happened i mean just like a stress crack or maybe hit something or any indication of what might have caused it i don't I, yeah i think we don't the boat's chartered, so we don't really have a great history of the boat. We obviously know the, the races it's done, but we don't actually know how old that rod, you know, that 
particular rudder is. We don't know yeah. whether it's been damaged before or not. Um, um, so it's just one of those things of having a 20 year old chartered boat. You don't know yeah, the history yeah, yeah. of everything and you're yeah. not in control of, of everything. Yeah, and the new one you made yourself or that you, you already had that? So you know Yeah, that no, we had to make you. that. I think Alan obviously used the spare uh, that was with the boat in the last race. And obviously we're, we're a relatively low budget team. Uh -huh. So it's actually quite a big chunk of money for us to, to build it. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's not, it's relatively, but it's not, it's relatively common for people to have rudder problems. So yeah, I, would, right? yeah. I would feel yeah. uncomfortable sending her off without it. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. committed to building one. Yeah, I think we, we mm. saw this a lot, right? And a lot of people also, I got a lot of comments when uh, when Alex, of course, now yeah. had to quit the race over the rudder. A lot of people said like, he brought so many stuff, but not a rudder. That's yeah. like the first thing that goes, right? So yeah. I guess great planning on your part uh, to make sure that that uh, was there. And um, uh, are there any other things on the boat? Because she's doing, again, uh, great now, sailing uh, great. And, you know, uh, well, I mean, never say that this is actually the toughest part in the race because, uh, you know, this is a very strange race this year and everything seems to be different than what it usually is. Um, but uh, providing that you will, you know, get through the rest of it and, you know, get around the Cape, is the boat, uh, you know, more or less 100% now, or are there any other things that you guys are like working on, um, you know, r restoring that might still, you know, create problems later in the race, or is the boat more or less 100% uh, bar the small things that are always happening? Of course. Yeah, we're not too bad. I mean, we've still got the wind issue, which weirdly sorted itself out for 12 hours yesterday. Um, she had wind speed and wind angle, and ah. we don't know why. Um, but then the wind speed disappeared again. So. Um, that's an intermittent problem. Um, yeah. She's obviously been living with that for nearly a week, I think. Um, yeah. So I think she's got a fairly good grip on on sailing the boat like that. And she was performing well um, yeah. before yeah. the rudder problem. Um, I mean, obviously, we haven't tested this rudder in anger. So, that, you know, I'd be happier in a week when she's been on that rudder for a week and there's no problems with how it's connected in the boat and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but otherwise, we're, yeah, we're not in bad shape. We're not in bad shape. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, many, it's already been said many times, but, you know, with her boat, with her budget and everything being in 15th place and really having earned it that way, I think is uh, really uh, very, very uh, amazing uh, what you've done. So, um, yeah, well, I guess that's pretty much uh, what we had to uh, talk about uh, here then. But uh, thank you very much, Job, for the, for the insights. And, uh, well, let's hope we don't have to talk again uh, over something else uh, happening. I'll just do that at the end of the race. But uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show and giving us a little uh, insight in that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Job. Have a nice day. Yeah. Bye. So that was uh, Geoff Brown, the uh, technical uh, director of uh, uh, Team Pip Hair Racing. And uh, yeah, very good to see that she's uh, racing again now. And we can actually, uh, you know, take a look at where she is racing right now. If I bring you into the screen here. And so, uh, yeah, we can see that uh, she is uh, going along at a nice... 14.1 uh, knot average over the last four hours doing 13.5 again now so nice uh, speeds and um, you know, let's see uh, what the other two chaps in front of her are doing yeah so Arnold right now running away from her you know quite a bit uh, uh, faster Alan of course uh, with his hydraulic problem um, you know not being able to fully use the power of his keel a little bit uh, slower and uh, we can also uh, see that uh, Jeremy Bijou going at a staggering 7.9 uh, knots, really catching up uh, with Pip also uh, very, very quickly. He's getting very, very close uh, to this group. Actually, let's check for a minute how uh, many miles he's actually behind. So right now, Pip's 2600. So he's about 70 miles behind Pip. So very, very uh, close by. And if he goes basically at this speed. So let's see, he's doing 17.9, a 15.1 average. Now she's about a knot, knot and a half uh, slower, so about a mile. So uh, yeah, if they keep slogging at it like this, it'll still be, you know, maybe two days or so for Jeremy to uh, possibly overtake her. But on the other hand, if she slows down even a little bit, could go uh, very fast, but we'll have to see uh, how it goes. It's good to see though that if we look at the weather right now, that she actually made the change because we can see this much stronger uh, system approaching uh, from the back and uh, you know that will hit them in about well 24 hours or so a little bit over so it's good to see that she's uh, you know all sped up 
again, which is uh, which is really good. Okay, so now let's move to the front of the field and actually take a good look at what's happening there because, uh, well, as we saw actually the day before also, Yannick is just absolutely uh, killing it in front of the uh, field there, really sailing an amazing uh, race through this, uh, you know, weather spaghetti as I like to uh, call it. And so far, seems that he hasn't made a wrong choice uh, uh, yet. Again, increased his lead a little bit uh, to now 399 nautical miles, so more or less 400 nautical miles ahead of uh, Apivia, which you know, who's very close to uh, linked out right now. They're kind of sort of sailing uh, together, and we see that it's uh, you know pretty pretty chaotic over here. So uh, part of the fleet has now uh, uh, tacked, including uh, Jean Le Cam, by the way, who recently tacked. The rest are still. Uh, you know, following their path a little bit more uh, to the east until they can actually also uh, make the tag. But they're in strong winds, however, they are all beating. So yeah, speeds of 10, 12, sometimes 13 knots, not going to be much faster uh, than that. Um, while at the same time we see uh, both Apivia and Linked Out now both pretty uh, fast because they finally have some wind that's actually favorable to them. But on the other hand, if we look, if we zoom in a little bit, the direction is not going to be very favorable for very long. And personally, when I look at this picture, I don't really see uh, what they're what they're doing because it is such a chaotic system. You know, both Charlie and Thomas are making their way more to the east uh, right now, whilst the wind actually should allow them to move much more towards the north. I mean, it seems like they could be sailing a line more or less straight after Yannick right now, and in the end, north is where they have to go. So if there's some kind of uh, thing with the weather that makes them feel that it's more prudent to move more to the uh, uh, east right now in order to get north later, I would say sure. But uh, having looked at the prediction, personally, uh, I don't necessarily see and, you know, again, don't like ignore the, the tracks that you that you see here, because um, often right now they are completely uh, kind of crazy. But um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to me that prudence to uh, like a, much reason why they wouldn't just uh, aim much more north, more or less in the same direction that Yannick is sailing in right now and just kind of go straight after him. I think they would lose, um, you know, less, less miles and get themselves more in the right direction uh, uh, at this point. Um, other than that, everything that is happening here, you know, makes makes a lot of sense. And for the larger prediction, if I move out a little bit here and run through the weather, what we're seeing is that, um, well, as you can see, let's run through it a little bit, that we see this kind of small high pressure systems keep uh, moving uh, through from west to east. We see new ones being kind of thrown off of the uh, of the continent there every once in a while and so that's going to be a constant hindrance for the fleet. We see this kind of line that is kind of uh, starting to form kind of above uh, Yannick's position might uh, become a problem. Several of them might get stuck in there but then we're already three days into the prediction again and so uh, you know at this point I'm just going to uh, go out and say that there is really no way to predict this. I would like if I was sitting in this position, you're more or less looking 100 miles ahead and saying, "What is the best choice now?" And when we get there, we will we will see, because it's such small systems that are constantly interlocking and kind of changing each other. That uh, yeah, the prediction hasn't the predictions haven't worked out for the last two days. So I've been keeping a track on this and. You know, when you look at the prediction now, but you look tomorrow, the situation is definitely going to be quite a bit different than what was predicted. So it's chaos weather and there's just, uh, you know, not much to look at except for the 24 hour uh, uh, prediction right now, which is basically, so this is the moment right now. If we go 24 hours ahead, we see uh, if we go in kind of increments, this happening. So we see those two kind of high pressures a little bit uh, to the north of Yannick 
moving uh, uh, towards the uh, east, which is definitely going to cause him some uh, stalling. We see that the wind for uh, both uh, Thomas and uh, Charlie keeps good, but they don't really need to make this kind of round bend. They could just uh, go up a bit more steeply. And we see the same thing for the uh, for the hunters that, you know, they, they will have a good bit of wind at least for the next 24 hours. And after that, I'm afraid to say because it's just such chaos up there. If we look at the Cape, so uh, and the weather that uh, uh, that Pip and basically the whole group uh, now with uh, with Jeremy Bijou, uh, with uh, Arno Bozeris and the rest of the crew are going to be uh, running into Alan Rora here. We see that right now, so they're in pretty strong weather. That's going to follow them, but we have this uh, this high pressure kind of ahead of them, which seems to be uh, kind of spreading out. Or Anna oh, actually, yeah, it, it sort of starts to develop in a in a bit of an unexpected way, and then actually instead of kind of being moved down it's kind of moving up a little bit getting right in the way of them and so how that exactly like normally these strong systems will move down into the cape but this particular one seems to be turning up and that that's because of the the function of this um, you know high pressure a little bit more north which is a similar thing that's happening there so we see all around we see this kind of quirky high pressures going around interfering with the more regular uh, way of the weather and so unclear how they are going to be uh, passing the Cape but it looks like they're going to be very kind of confused uh, weather with some strong weather maybe coming from the other side as they pass the Cape but then again we are we are looking at a prediction that's three days from now so hard to say anything uh, really definitive about that but that's what it looks like um, then if we go a little bit more to the back we see pretty uh, much the same thing so uh, you know I think we have more or less everybody well except for uh, uh, Sebastian Desromeu because he's now so far behind but we have everybody else kind of the rest in uh, in view here and uh, if we run through the weather we see that uh, yeah a lot of interspersal with this kind of local high pressures but miraculously they seem to be staying ahead or right behind most of the ships so um, yeah, for, for the next 24 hours or so at least, they're all going to be seemingly sailing along nicely. Not going to get too close to the ice line, because as you can see, now I don't think that uh, Alexia Berrier is going to actually go this close to the ice line, but you see that these high pressures are kind of moving and kind of hovering around the ice line, so they're probably all going to do what Arya Heusela seems to be doing, which is actually staying away from the from the direct zone of the ice line and actually sailing a little bit higher. So a little bit longer route, but, uh, but better wind, which is all in all not really going to contribute to very fast speeds uh, uh, there. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much the, uh, the run through of what's happening in the fleet uh, right now. And so that's the uh, show for today. Uh, thank you again very much for watching. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up if you uh, enjoy these videos. And for all the info or other uh, information, go to seawallstv.com. Uh, By the way, I want to reiterate, so uh, we're working with uh, Team Childhood on uh, creating some kind of training day somewhere in the end of March or beginning of April. Depending, of course, how everything goes with the corona and we are, you know, expecting that the weather will be better. I mean, you know, maybe those people that want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated by then and everything will be a lot safer and, uh, you know, the different lockdown rules will come down. We'll have to see. It's all pending, but, you know, we got to make some kind of plans. And so uh, I'll soon communicate on the website also the price of the day and everything. But if you're interested, want to keep appraised of when this training day of, uh, you know, several of the seawolves being able to sail on the childhood and, you know, learn how it is to kind of sail a boat like that for a day altogether uh, please send an email uh, to uh, contact at ceiling of at uh, seawallstv.com to be uh, kept updated on the progress there uh, you know as we uh, get more and more details on that so again thank you all for watching and uh, see you again tomorrow with a delicious cup of coffee have a nice evening ciao